but I'm, I'm here to introduce, um, with, with great pleasure, I have to say, uh, Sammy Tamimi. And uh, Sammy's a psychiatrist. He works in the UK. He works in uh, Lincoln. Um, he's going to talk to us about lots of ideas and dilemmas. Um, he's written many, many things. He's been quite prolific, although he said earlier that he's now slowing down a bit. I would like to be as slow as him in his writing. But he's going to touch on uh, a lot of the threads that were spoken about by Olga and by Robert this morning. I think he's going to pull some of those through for us. Um, I want to give you some quotes, and this is two quotes that uh, are from Sammy. The only evidence-based conclusion that can be drawn is therefore that formal psychiatric systems like ICD and DSM should be abolished. <laughs> and the second quote that really struck me was this, dumbing down what we do into simplistic diagnosis driven protocols has more to do with successful consumer culture marketing than science. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to say any more about Sammy Tamimi. It is a great pleasure to have him here to do his presentation. Following his presentation, we have John Schotter and Harleen Anderson who are sitting in the wings who will offer some of their thoughts following that. And hopefully we'll have some other questions before we close at 3.30. Sammy Tamimi. Mm, thank you. Well, is this working? You can hear me? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to come. And it's um, always very enjoyable to be in places where you can have conversations with people who have at least some understanding of what you're talking about so that you don't have to uh, find yourself keeping trying to repeat things, keeping going back to basics and so on. In the last, um, yesterday and today, I've heard a lot of talk about how do we change things, about revolution, about, and, 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 and some degree of pessimism at the size of the task. And I just wanted to maybe um, encourage you not to give up. Because if you look at what's happened where change does happen and genuine paradigm shifts happen, they often come when there is some sort of critical mass that has been reached. So if you look at civil rights movements or political revolutions and even revolutions in scientific thinking, they often take a time. But then when the change happens, it tends to be quite rapid. There comes a tipping point. Now, we don't know when that tipping point is going to occur. Nobody quite predicted when the banks were going to collapse. Nobody quite predicted when the whole Soviet bloc was about to um, undergo a radical transformation. Uh, but a tipping point kind of um, reached itself. And for those who get you know, pessimistic about the possibilities of change, I often think about um, the Cuban Revolution. Now, whatever you think about the Cuban Revolution, um, it's still going, and it started out with 12 people who got on a boat. And that's all it was. It was 12 fanatical, dedicated, whatever people. So change can sometimes come from unexpected quarters. And there is a lot going on, as I'm hoping to, to uh, show you today, that gives me some sense that, you know, keep going. There, is, there are things out there. there. There are not just small islands of um, uh, exemplary practice. But there's also other bits going on, for example, that many of you will probably not be exposed to in the academic arena. And this is where I've been taking 
the struggle myself and, and many of my colleagues in Britain in the Critical Psychiatry Network, one of the things that we've done is that we have consciously decided to play on the same playing field. So we've um, been very interested in the potential offered to us by the evidence-based medicine movement. Uh, so we've been actively looking at and writing about um, the evidence. And uh, this is a little bit of what I'm going to talk to you about, because the way we practice has very little to do with the evidence. And if you read people like um, Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn's analysis of the way uh, revolutions happen in science, what tends to happen is, and it has some parallels with the way revolutions sometimes happen in political life, is that a system, a way of thinking, um, eventually has so many anomalies in it that initially people try to deal with the anomalies by adjusting the system this way and that way. But at some point, there are enough people who are saying, hang on a minute, you cannot squeeze this data into this system anymore. And if you, you, you can look at the history of this in all sorts of branches of science, and that what we need is a new organizing framework in order to make sense of this data that's coming up. Um, so one of, one of the tasks for those of us who are looking at the evidence is to keep pointing out the anomalies. And one of the things that's helped those of us who are um, identified themselves as, as psychiatrists and as critical psychiatrists is that we've been publishing in mainstream medical journals. And actually, the mainstream medical journals, many of them, more so than the psychiatric journals, are very interested in, in some of the work that um, we've been doing and publish our papers quite regularly. So what we now have is an established body of evidence that's recognized in mainstream medicine, which actually also acts as a way of protecting us when we are challenged, because we can refer to this body of evidence that supports. So little by little, we're trying to do things um, within mainstream uh, thinking, playing on their same territory, you know, to, to use that footballing an analogy, you know, we're, we're playing in the same game, we're on the same pitch, we're not going to some setting up a separate league and, and complaining about, you know, the unjustness of that league. So we're, we're trying to take them on their own territory. So don't give up. So um, a few conceptual things then before uh, I look at some of the evidence. These are by necessity generalizations. Um, they, they are not totalitizing ideas, but I think they are useful orientating constructs towards a backdrop towards what I'm thinking about here. The first of them is this idea of scientism, that our field has been plagued by the illusion of science and the illusion that um, the types of problems that we deal with in our clinical work, which are related to human distress and human relationships and human function, are reducible to discoverable laws in the same way as you find in the natural sciences. This model has been very good for general medicine in terms of uncovering etiological pathways and in terms of our understanding of physiology and making our treatments match an understanding of what's happening at the physical level. But when it's been translated into the mental health field, it has become scientism. It has become science as a faith, as a cosmology. Okay. The second backdrop to this is the effects of our orientating political ideology, which is also an orientating uh, economic ideology, which is that of neoliberalism. And one of the pushes of neoliberalism, which you see in the way I'm thinking about uh, diagnostic constructs, brands of therapy, is that to get literally, as well as metaphorically, purchase in the marketplace, 
you have to turn things into a commodity and an industry develops around it. And this is quite a powerful push. And the third um, little backdrop to this is thinking about globalization and a particular type of globalization that's been happening um, much more actively in the past 20 and uh, 30 years since kind of neoliberalism has become a much more global phenomena is the active exporting of ways of thinking, of beliefs and practices, and the active exporting to increase the market share, it seems to me, of the current mental health ideologies that we are dealing with. And this is something uh, which I find very distressing, that low and middle income countries are, uh, that there is active moves to scale up Western-style mental health services. And it coincides for me as well with the worrying development in the area of childhood because this has become another expanding market for marketing a Western idea about health and illness um, in the mental health systems that we use. And that's now really got into the area of childhood and understanding of childhood. Okay. Does that make sense, by the way? Yeah. Now, real people living real lives around the world and real children exist in a whole variety of contexts. And one of the problems about the narrow models that we've developed to understand the problems of childhood is we start missing the very thing that I felt that child psychiatry would bring to the practice of healthcare, which is this kind of context-rich understanding of people's lives. And you can see this at all sorts of levels. You can see it at the level of the individual, how they make sense of their histories, how they um, incorporate bits of their own cultural background with perhaps bits of the peer group cultural background. You can see it in families, what are the family's histories, what are their socioeconomic uh, capacities, what sorts of misfortunes and fortunes have, have befell them, how much of a social network do they have. You can see it at the level of society, what is going on in the society, what's the level of social inequality, what's the crime rate, what's the education system like, what's, and so on and so forth. So real people's lives are textured, are context-rich, are multi-layered, and contain lots of avenues, lots of stories, um, bits of misfortune, strengths, and lots of ways in to trying to help people understand what's going on, or to help people find ways forward when things have become uh, stuck. So we have this um, real lives going on. And then we have systems that have come around trying to make sense of those real lives when things uh, are going wrong. And I think um, earlier, uh, I can't remember if it was in the workshop or, or, or one of these lectures, we, somebody was talking about the history of, of childhood. That um, uh, the whole idea of childhood is actually quite a recent one. So even if, we, even if when we start with the concept of childhood, it's not an unproblematic concept because our ideas about when childhood starts, when it finishes, changes and has changed over the uh, centuries. Um, and our idea of where children fit in. So the, the, the idea that children have separate institutions to adults is a fairly recent development historically. So the idea of mass education, for example, is only about 150 years old. It's not really um, that old. And we've had various changing constructions. And one of the things that seems to go missing when we go down the narrow pathway of constructing um, childhood and its problems in terms of narrow diagnostic and increasingly biomedical categories is um, 
is an understanding about where those ideas, about how we categorize them, have come from. If we look at our diagnostic systems, for example, we, we can see that many of them have developed out of what you might call Western folk ideas about childhood and its problems. Looking at child psychiatry, one of the major cleavage points is something that has been categorized as externalizing disorders and something that has been categorized as internalizing disorders. Now, these are both very individually centered, so they, 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 you know, already that context bit that uh, I was mentioning has gone. But the individually centered sits very nicely with the age of the reason, also sits very nicely with our philosophies about the individual and the nature of our political economic system, which focuses on the uh, individual at the expense of the social. But it also st starts a very gender-specific or a, 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 not a gender specific, but a, in the direction of gendered type thinking. So externalizing disorders, which then get um, divided into further subcategories, are basically behaviors, external behaviors, and that's mainly with younger children, and it's nearly, it's something like three to four times as common in boys. And then internalizing disorders points towards emotional states internal to the person, tend to be in older children, particularly starting in adolescence, and tend to be states of depression and anxiety, and the gender split tends to now go towards girls. So with boys we notice their behavior, with girls we notice their emotions. You know, this is, this is a very long-standing Western way of thinking. And what goes missing is boys' emotion and well-being, what's happening to them emotionally when we just look at their behavior. And what goes missing is um, how we think about uh, young women and their behaviors. Making sense so far? And of course, if we were to look at the idea that these are pointing towards technologies of the self, ideas about how the self is understood, how the self is constructed. And if we look around the world, we'll see actually different cultures have very different conceptions about what the nature of the self is and how you go towards understanding the nature of the self. And this is just a, a, a little... A little example, for example, in many Eastern philosophies, uh, not necessarily in terms of religious systems, but cer certainly in terms of philosophical systems, uh, such as that uh, you might find in Confucian or in some uh, Buddhist philosophies, knowledge is to be gained through introspection and through experience. And this is a very different idea about how you gain knowledge about the self. In, in Western models, of course, with the age of reason and with the nature of how our economies work and so on, knowledge is gained by measuring things and turning things into quantities and categorizing things. So we have different systems for how we ar arrive at. Anyway, enough of philosophy for a bit. Now, this is the other thing that's sitting behind some of the things I'm going to talk about and some of the evidence that I'm going to show you. Branding is a really important way in which things get into the cultural sphere. And what it means is that the, uh, the, the diagnoses that we have develop a life of their own within the broader culture not just within the professional culture. And people start to identify. They sometimes become um, uh, parts of people's identity and they uh, absorb them in certain ways and try to, try to work with them. They also become ways of making money, ways of establishing careers. They're, they're, a whole industry develops uh, around them. And one of the reasons why it can be very difficult to fight the concept of diagnosis and why people then say, well, what are you going to do instead, 
is that diagnoses work really well as brands. They can enter into the marketplace and they can compete. And what you will find is, you know, even within diagnosis, certain fashions come and go. You know, bipolar disorder became very fashionable in certain countries. It didn't in others. Um, autism has become much more fashionable than ADHD. Uh, ADHD is kind of a bit yesterday, and um, uh, uh, so so you, you you kind of see these things almost following ideas of, of fashion and what's fashionable and what's um, what's getting the um, uh, consumer market energized. Okay. So those are the sorts of things sitting behind what I'm going to say. Um, in terms of the evidence and how we interpret the evidence. And what I'm going to move on to now is just to take a couple of uh, examples from very common childhood diagnosis, mainly looking at ADHD and autism, and just look a little bit at some of the evidence and just to give you a flavor of the types of um, ways the evidence is presented and what the actual more accurate picture is. And this is useful ammunition to know about. So in, in psychiatry we have this vision of a psychiatric technology which will lead to that we will develop a classification system that will sort of carve nature at the joints in the same way that the rest of medicine has, has managed to do so that our, our divisions reflect some natural either physical or psychological divisions that we can um, arrive at and that will help us understand, if you like, a cause-based model and therefore help guide us towards the correct treatment. So a good system like this should help us improve our scientific knowledge and it should help us improve the outcomes from our clinical practice. And I would put to you, if it's not able to do that, the problem might not be that we haven't been looking long enough or we haven't been researching deep enough. It might be that we have the wrong paradigm. And that's the conclusion I've come to. So in this paradigm, it's not that other things are ignored. It's not that context or cultural issues, ethics and, and, and other things are ignored, but they become of secondary importance. And the primary task in systems developed around this vision of a psychiatric technology is that the primary task is a technological one of arriving at the correct diagnosis and from there being able to understand what the correct treatment would be based on making a correct diagnosis. But what evidence do we have for this? Um, and how is this playing out in real life? First of all, I'm going to give you an example of how a diagnosis turns into a commodity and becomes internalized in the broad culture in a really quite interesting way when you think about it. So, autism. Um, autism was defined and the definition still includes these three areas of behavior. So firstly, it's defined on the idea of an inability to read other people's emotional states, which leads to an inability for reciprocal social interaction. Some sort of communica communication language type problems and evidence of a restricted imagination. This is the triad of symptoms, okay? Now, I'm going to show you... This is a, um, a clip from a news program that's shown to children. A prime-time British news program called Newsround that, that um, uh, children and young people watch. Um, Watch it and see what you think. And keep in mind what the three symptoms are of autism. 
I'm going to take you into my world. Imagination. Show you how autism effects kids in all sorts of different ways. I'm not a logical person, as you may know. I want to be different. I ask to be different. I am different. But that however it affects you, it doesn't have to hold you back. So stick with me and find out what it really means to be autistic. <laughs> autism I have is called Asperger's Syndrome and sometimes it makes me see things a little bit differently. I get very sensitive and I can't control it and sometimes it's a bad thing because all the other kids are laughing when I'm just crying and screaming at things that they're not. Every single thing, even things that I'm living, have a, has a personality and a life. If there's two pairs of shoes and I pick one and I feel like the other pair would be feel left out or something. I don't like saying certain words because they just make me feel all tense and unhappy. A lot of people with autism like that sometimes mixes their senses up a little bit. I can feel words. I used to describe a word as being slimy or prickly because that's what it tasted or or fell when I said it, or when other people said it. Quite a lot of people don't have much understanding about it. They don't mean to be mean, but it does hurt my feelings because of my sensitivity. So what exactly is autism? People with autism have problems relating to others and making sense of the world around them. Scientists know it affects the way the brain works, but they don't know what causes it. Boys are much more likely to be autistic than girls, and it can run in families. Autism isn't rare. One in every hundred people is autistic, and it comes in all shapes and sizes. I get very stressed in crowds. Um, I have anxiety issues. I'm sometimes easily distracted, easily annoyed. It's a bit difficult for me uh, uh, with the how-to conversation. Uh, I need to try to think very hard about it. If someone does touch me, I say, can you please not do it again? I sort of feel sometimes like people will try to hurt me. It feels uh, uh, uncomfortable at, uh, when the people crowd it. I'm not really nervous, but I, I, it's kind of, I can't describe it, I'm sorry, I can't really describe it. Although it can be a problem, I wouldn't swap my autism for anything. It makes me who I am, I just wouldn't be the same without it. For instance, I think it gives me my imagination. Uh, did anybody spot any, um, I don't want to, you know, comment too much on, on her own understanding and how she's tried to incorporate and resist the label at the same time, um, which is interesting in itself. But if we think back to the three symptoms, lack of imagination, difficulty with social communication, and difficulty with language. Where did... Where, and, and this, this young woman now has an idea that there is something wrong with her brain that makes her different to uh, other people. Um, so once it becomes a commodity, anything can happen to it. Um, uh, and and um, you'll see that with a lot of these diagnoses. It's like somebody's a bit different or somebody doesn't fit into an increasingly narrow idea of what we think of as normal. And we have to find a category for them. Um, and then people have to try and make sense of that in a way. And so uh, as well, we've got all these autism tests and they use the language of tests. And I have families coming to me in my practice saying that it's been suggested that their daughter or son should be tested for autism. You know, this is, a, this is the medical language. These are just questionnaires or observational things. They, can, they can't 
tap something intrinsic in a person, all they can do is measure somebody's perception at a particular moment in time about on particular questions. That's all they do. But these are tests, you know, and they make a lot of money. Um, and again, we see the globalization of the concept of autism. And one of the most worrying things to me is, um, uh, is this study in Korea. So when I was training, autism was um, thought to be a very rare condition affecting four in 10,000 children, most of whom would present with moderate to severe learning difficulties. Now we're talking about 1.5% of children, and then there's this study in Korea um, in a country which hasn't until now recognized the idea of autism, and there's been a group who've uh, been campaigning that this is a, this is, um, a group that, that it's not being recognized because it's stigmatizing, and now we need to campaign to... So they, they did 55,000 children, and they found 2.6% 2, 2 of them, they decided, could be diagnosed with autism in this study. Um, virtually none of them were attending any specialist services. Now, what does that do to these 2.6% children who were otherwise attending mainstream schools, getting on with their life, who've now been identified with the label of autism? And as far as the whole thing of cultural variation, when you think about symptoms that people look for, include things like you know, eye-to-eye -eye contact, which is a very cultural thing. Different cultures have different ideas about looking at each other and, and who you're allowed to look with and, and, and who you're not. Uh, finger pointing, rote learning, and, and these kind of things that are thought of as uh, obsession. I mean, it ju just goes missing. You know, all these context-rich things. Okay. So ADHD, we'll do a bit about ADHD, and I'll go a bit more into the evidence now, and just to give you a little flavor. Um, so you should all be familiar with that, hyperactivity, inattention. It was onset before age of seven. In the new DSM-5, is onset before the age of 12 to enable more people to be diagnosed who might otherwise not have been diagnosed and who are therefore being denied services, of course. And what is ADHD symptoms? Every single symptom is preceded by the word often. Now, how do you define often? Is it once a minute? Is it once an hour? Is it once a day? And then, how do you, how do you define fails to give close attention. So what's close attention? What's a unit of close attention? That, could anybody define that to me? And what's a unit of careless mistakes? So all, all the, um, the whole idea of switching towards um, what are called operational definitions was um, that if we operationalize the definition so that we had clear descriptions of symptoms and we could say you need to have five out of these nine symptoms to get the diagnosis, we would be able to improve the reliability. I'll show you uh, later that we haven't improved the reliability. But all that happens is you shift the problem of, of the descriptive, old descriptive categories into the actual symptoms. You just change the place where the problem is. So we haven't solved that problem at all. And so not surprisingly, when we start looking at some of the, um, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the literature bit in a minute. Um, because another way of illustrating this problem is to do, is to ask yourself these questions. If I was to ask you what is ADHD, the only way really you could answer it is by giving me a definition that is based around the behavior. So you say ADHD is inattention, hyperactivity, blah, blah, blah. If I was to ask you what is diabetes and, I, and you were to give me a um, response or even better, if you were to ask me what is diabetes and I was to give you as a doctor a response that says, well, diabetes is actually being thirsty, going to the toilet a lot, some fatigue, you know, I could be struck off. 
because um, those symptoms could be caused by a number of different things. And my job as a doctor would be to get some independent data that's independent to my opinion, still needs interpreting, but some independent data to help me understand what might be happening pathophysiologically. Because diabetes has to be defined as a malfunction in your uh, sugar metabolism. You can't define it behaviorally. Yeah? So that il illustrates the different ontological status. But another way of, of um, seeing how uh, understanding how what we have in diagnoses are just descriptors, not explanations, is to ask yourself this question. So this kid can't concentrate and is hyperactive. What is causing that? Now, if I answered it's caused by ADHD, as a lot of people uh, tend to think, then a legitimate question is to ask, how do you know it's ADHD? And my answer would be, because they are hyperactive and inattentive. And we would go around in circles. So deconstructing diagnosis is actually very, very easy. You can do it with, with any of the families and young people that, that you see. You just explain that diagnoses are descriptions, but they do not give us explanations. And I use this idea of diabetes and, and, and ADHD. Um, so do we have any evidence that these diagnoses are as they are called at the moment, neurodevelopmental and genetically predetermined. Two main sources of literature, the genetic literature and the brain imaging literature. And I've tried to keep on top of this because I think this is key in terms of being able to play on the same field as the others. So this is an example of a study in 2010 that went global in terms of the news. And this is a, a quote from the lead author of the study. This is really exciting because it gives us the first direct genetic link to ADHD. We can now say with confidence that ADHD is a genetic disease and that the brains of children with this condition develop differently to those of others. Okay, that's what went out in the news. A very firm, definitive statement. This is what they actually found. So what they were looking for, something called copy number variants. And since we've had the ability to decode the human genome, these genetic studies are coming out quicker and faster, and they're becoming cheaper, and we're getting larger and larger numbers who, uh, where this type of research is taking place. So we are now looking at the molecular genetic level. And the hope that we were going to be finding things is rapidly disappearing. But let's have a look at this, this study. They had about 450 children diagnosed with ADHD, and they had about 1,000 children who were the control group. And what they were looking for is bits of genetic code that were repeated where they shouldn't be or missing where they should be. These are called copy number variants. And in their study, they found 13.9% of those diagnosed with ADHD had these copy number variants against 7.4 controls. Uh, which leaves you with 6.5% could be attributable to that. You following me with the maths? Yeah? Hardly a, a, a resounding number, but it doesn't stop there. They also measured the IQ, or, the, or they did IQ testing with the group with ADHD, and they um, found in those who were categorized as having um, learning difficulties, so those with an IQ below 70, they found 36% had these copper number variants. Now, if my maths is correct, that's more than 13.9%. And therefore, that becomes what's called a, co uh, a confounding factor, which means that in your control group, you would have to control for IQ levels for that comparison to be correct. Now, if you take the people with IQ below 70 out, it's, it now leaves 11.4% of the rest of the group with, uh, with these copy number variants against uh, the control group, which is 7.4%. So we're now at 4%, yeah? So we're getting even lower. But it doesn't stop there, because even after you take out the group with IQ below 70, 
the average IQ in the less rest of the group is 86%. Now, if the normal control group is, is a normal control group, they didn't measure the IQ, but you would have to assume the IQ would approximate to around 100, because that's what, what the normal um, the, the mean is. So I think that final 4% will disappear as well. So this study that heralds, yeah, we finally found it, does exactly the opposite. And I'm sure they must know that. I mean, this is just basic, basic reading. But somehow it gets past the reviewers and it gets into one of the leading medical journals. And the studies that are looking at gene, genes for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, ADHD, autism, they're all drawing blanks. And the number one confounder is, is level of IQ. When you control for IQ, you're left with 1 or 2%. In, a, in most of the studies. So now they've got this concept that all of these conditions are broadly connected and they're all type of neurodevelop... they're all on a spectrum of neurodevelopmental conditions. And that what our task is now, instead of maybe abandoning the idea that genetics is the right place to look for this stuff, is they're um, arguing that they need bigger and more money and they're now up to thousands and thousands in their cohorts and still not finding anything. And what it is, is that there's lots of small genes adding, uh, working collaboratively somehow to produce these neurodevelopment, because we know it's genetic, you know? What about the neuroimaging studies? Um, I'm just going to read to you a, um, a summary from uh, a, a very large review that took place in the UK and is related to the national guidelines that ha happen in the UK. And I'm very aware of this because uh, I, I was invited to, be, um, to, to speak at a conference that that group organized. Um, so I had a kind of first-hand knowledge of, of some of the strange processes that went on. But this is, this is what they conclude about the uh, brain imaging studies in ADHD. And I have to take a deep breath for this, okay? This is what might be implicated. Left prefrontal cortex, left thalamus, right paracentral lobe, frontal temporal, the parietal lobes, the striatum, the spleetum of the corpus callosum, the right cordae, total cerebral uh, volume, right cerebral volume, and proportions of the cerebellum. Um, and it goes on to state, in terms of risk factors, uh, a whole lot of possible environmental factors. And to me, I mean, the, uh, and on top of that, they can't exclude the possibility that medication might be um, the reason why they're finding these these findings, um, uh, and 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 to me it's a bit like you know betting on every horse in the race and then celebrating your ability to predict the winner. It's consistently inconsistent. This is the pattern that comes out again and again, um, and that's why we're no closer to understanding what is happening in the brains of people diagnosed with ADHD, probably because there is nothing characteristic going on there. And that is the most likely reason. You know, this is one of the anomalies that I was talking about. Uh, interestingly, there have been a number of studies and, and a meta-analysis that has looked at the studies at different ages. And what they came to the conclusion was that um, the uh, children with ADHD, their differences, their statistical differences seem to um, become, uh, seem to disappear by the ages of about somewhere between 18 and 20. So, um, uh, and they, they felt that uh, um, there was a lag of about two, three years in the maturation of... Now, this is very interesting. It's interesting in two ways. It's interesting theoretically because the effects of medication, the stimulants that most children and these studies are taking, is that we know it interferes with things like growth hormone, myelination, things like that. And if you look at um, growth rates, they tend to lag um, two to three years behind their peer group in terms of weight and height in particular, but also in terms of cartilage development, myelination, and other bits of the body. So that to me, it would be consistent with a possible medication-induced effect, that actually the medication is contributing towards this lag, but eventually they too catch up. The authors of the main 
um, meta-analysis concluded that what was happening is that these children had abnormal brains in the first place and the medication had helped them achieve normal levels. Isn't it amazing? Yeah? Unbelievable. And, I mean, you could make some, you, you really couldn't make this stuff up. Um, just a, f a few, a few, a couple of very recent studies, and it, and um, I could quote you so many of these these studies. Uh, a large um, look at genetics um, uh, associated with behavior problems, including those diagnosed with ADHD, and they couldn't find anything. So they decide rather than maybe there is nothing to find there. They conclude that there is probably a non-additive genetic influence which will make it more difficult to identify genes responsible for heritability. For goodness sake, when are you going to give up? You know? You know, study after study, they don't find things, but they're still convinced it's there. This is what I mean about the Kuhn anomaly things. Sooner or later, these anomalies have to give way. You know, sooner or later, um, there's going to be enough people saying, look, the systems that you have created do not fit the evidence. Um, and same with genetics and autism, uh, and same with neuroimaging and autism. And we've been doing this for a long time. Why are we waiting? Why do we keep funding study after study, looking for stuff that it consistently doesn't find? So the most recent thing is, interestingly, the National Institute of Mental Health in, in the US have given up on the idea of using DSM categories. This could be the beginning of the end for psychiatric diagnosis as we know it. But what they've got in place is a new thing called research domain criteria in which they've sectioned out what they consider to be mental functioning into a number of areas like reward and attachment behaviors and working memory and perception and all that. And so they're using this as their new system. It'll probably take another 10 to 20 years before similar results come out. Maybe then we'll be at the point of finally saying, we're looking in the wrong area. Yeah. So maybe we just have to put up with uh, an another attempt that will most likely produce the same failures. Yeah. I mean, if this was a business, you know, the bank keeps giving it money. So, yeah, we're going to get there. We're go you know, wh wh when do you stop? The reliability problem has not been solved. It's DSM-5, there's something called the Kappa score, which is a measure of how reliable. So one is perfect reliability. When you're down to point two in the Kappa score, it means that the, the, the chances of getting a diagnosis, the same diagnosis by different psychiatrists is no better than chance. And some of our major diagnostic categories, like generalized anxiety disorder, a major depressive disorder, the Kappa scores suggest that your likelihood of getting that diagnosis is no better than chance. What diagnosis you get, in other words, depends on who you see, not what your problem is. You know, it's re really astonishing stuff. Um, and I think those of you who are familiar with Bob Whitaker's and many other people's work will be aware that we've got an increasing number of people who are long-term patients, increasing numbers on disability living allowance in the UK, where which um, mental health reasons for, for drawing a disability living allowance has become the number one reason in the UK about um, two to three years ago. And most of it is for depression. Um, now, you know, the, the, the prognosis, of that, that's our new life cycle, by the way. The, the likelihood uh, of, uh, of, um, of an improved prognosis in the rest of medicine, your outcomes for treatment for cancers, for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, for all sorts of things, outcomes have consistently improved. In psychiatry, 
they appear to have got worse. That's not a, a sort of claim that uh, m makes me as a psychiatrist proud to be in that branch of medicine. But we should be looking at this. We have to take this sort of stuff uh, seriously. Our Royal College is taking something seriously in that it's pointing out that the um, likelihood of dying for those who have a mental illness, they die on average 25 to 30 years earlier than the rest of the population. What the Royal College is saying is uh, they're, they're dying of treatable illnesses, cardiovascular and metabolic being the two main ones. And they're putting it on the point of view that they are being discriminated against by the physical health services. But sooner or later, they're going to have to take some responsibility that the drugs that they're giving are causing a major reason behind some of these uh, increased um, physical illnesses that they have. And whichever way you look at the evidence base in diagnosis, it comes out as poor. So the problem of stigma, a real problem for many people. Study after study, there was the, the latest um, review that uh, I read included 30 studies of very different design, and it came to the same conclusion. Stigma is made worse by this idea that psychiatric illnesses are illnesses like any other illnesses. In the public's mind, it is associated with unpredictability and dangerousness and uh, a sense of wanting to increase your social distance. People are much, more less, much less likely to have stigmatizing feelings and attitudes if they can relate in some way. So psychosocial models, on the whole, have much less stigma associated with them because people can relate to that. And there's the whole issue of internal stigma, which I think has been mentioned, and public policy. One of the, one of the most um, useful studies in terms of the public policy impact is uh, the whole Beyond Blue campaign, which was to improve uh, understanding and access and treatment to mental health problems and that's been taking place in Australia and is still going. And why it was really a, an interesting one is because they set up a separate group to evaluate it. And they've been evaluating this and they um, you know, published their kind of 10-year data uh, a couple of years ago. And the conclusion they came to was that if you were categorized as having poor knowledge, which essentially means you rejected the medical model idea of mental illness, you had a much better chance of a better outcome. Fascinating. Now, we, we, you know, how much more evidence do we need that we're going down the wrong way? So stigma with kids. Um, we've got the whole question, if I, if I was to go back to a more context-rich, about who has the authority to make these decisions about what we consider to be normal. We have these kind of ridiculous debates going on, and they call it a debate about, you know, there is a controversy, maybe we're medicalizing too much, you know, 11% is, is clearly a wrong amount for 11% of the children to be diagnosed with ADHD, because we know it's 5%. Five. You know, who comes up with these ideas? Who is it who, who should have the authority to decide where these cutoff points come? And, and where the boundaries between normal. Um, and it really kind of starts to come alive, these debates, when you start to look at some of the cross-cultural literature and the different way people interpret what the behaviors mean in their local context. And I'll just give you a, a, an example from one of those studies. Because it involves two studies that happened in a different way, and that's the comparison between ADHD in the UK and ADHD in America. Um, so, um, uh, a sociologist who looked at the data, epidemiological data, on what types of characteristics led to a, a diagnosis of ADHD in the UK found that a, a diagnosis of ADHD in the UK tended to be much more in the lower social classes, much more in urban areas, and much more in areas that had high levels of violence. 
and that was the characterization. In the US, it was much more likely to happen amongst uh, a tendency towards the middle classes, um, and particularly in areas where the academic uh, achievement, um, particularly for boys, seemed to be lower compared to the national average. So she suggested um, and put forward this hypothesis that ADHD in the UK was understood as mainly a, a problem of uh, behavior and treatment was around behavioral control, whereas in the US it was mainly conceived as, as a problem of school performance. So um, uh, another study came along a couple of years later that interviewed children in the UK, about 150 children who were diagnosed with ADHD were interviewed in the UK and about 150 children in the US were interviewed in this study about their understanding about what ADHD is and how they conceptualized it. And lo and behold, um, children in the UK thought that their ADHD was something that caused them to get angry and lose their temper and that the treatment helped them learn self-control so that they didn't get into fights. In the US, the children were much more likely to conceive of ADHD as something that makes it difficult for them to concentrate in class and get on with their schoolwork and the treatment helped them stay on top uh, uh, of the schoolwork. So even if we just go across two countries that are using very similar ideas, and very similar systems, and very you, culturally you find different, um, uh, whole different constructs have um, emerged out of the local context and what's going on in the local context and all of this kind of goes missing and these are all parts of systems of um, surveillance and uh, I think Billy is going to sort of come and drag me off in a minute so I'm just going to um, do a, a couple of things can I have five minutes five minutes okay um, Peter Gotcha have I pronounced it right? I don't know. Dane Goethe. Okay. He's the latest of a number of people from mainstream medicine. And there have been some several high-profile people. Remember what I said about anomalies. Remember what I said about the evidence. And that things eventually do change if, if the anomalies are such that this system cannot be going on. So this, this is like, if I was to use a footballing metaphor of um, a UK-based one, he's like an Alex Ferguson, who's like a, a top manager in the, in the British League, you know. Um, he is so widely published, highly re respected. He's done work across the medical epidemiology field, a, a real high figure in the um, evidence-based medicine movement. And this is uh, his conclusion about psychiatric drugs. I've come to the conclusion that psychiatric drugs are the most corrupted ones. Psychiatry is the drug industry's paradise as definitions of psychiatric disorder are so vague and easy to manipulate, it's easy to seemingly make a, uh, produce a positive effect even for drugs that don't work. And finally, he concludes, our citizens would be far better off if we removed all the psychiatric drugs from the market as doctors are unable to handle them. It is inescapable that their availability creates more harm than good. Now, when people like him say that, you cannot keep saying, oh, it's a bunch of Scientologists who go around, you know, wanting to... So, it, you know, there, and he's been causing lots of waves, lots of, um, yeah, in, in many countries, because he's a very straight speaking sort of person, and he doesn't mince his words. So, um, uh, these voices are going to be very hard to ignore. Um, and we've got, and so, um, and if we look at real life outcomes, it is really quite appalling, the picture out there, in terms of what real-life services are producing in terms of their outcomes. 75% um, entering community mental health treatments in the US have no improvement. That's an astonishing figure when we look at what happens in the rest of medicine. As a report by the Center for Social Justice in the UK Decide, uh, came to the conclusion that only about 15% who attend mental health services in the UK achieve recovery. We know we can do better than that. We're using the wrong paradigm. 
it's not acceptable that we continue to do that. It is just not acceptable. And we can't wipe away these sorts of statistics and pretend that they don't exist. So, so I don't have time to go into... Um, and just, just, just a little bit about um, one of the... One of the um, one of the things that uh, we've we've been doing, we've been involved in um, a project for the past few years, and we've taken an American system that some of you might have heard of called Partners for Change Outcome Management System that use, um, and I think um, people like Barry Duncan who've developed that have done something quite clever strategy-wise, because they're using a very simple system to monitor people's outcomes. And they're developing it in, in connection with um, uh, an understanding of what the outcome literature says. Um, and at its heart is a social justice idea and an idea about how you bring the patient voice into the center and how you change the power dynamic between the patient or client and the practitioner. So it has a lot, lot of things embedded in it, but what, the, what they've been very clever with is that they have submitted this to rigorous research and have got it approved as an evidence-based treatment. It's not a treatment model, it's a meta model. It's a, it's a way of thinking about how you deliver services, but they've managed to do that. So, you know, that speaks the language of, of our employers. And, our, and so we had to do something, and this is where the double-edged sword bit comes because in order to get um, again literally and metaphorically purchase in a system you have to think about branding so we um, developed this uh, concept of an outcome orientated which is the OO approach so we've got OO CAMS um, and we had to develop that concept and we used a lot of the concepts from the, the American PCOMS model um, because w when we were we we started uh, competing for grants and we managed to get an innovation grant, and it needed to have some sort of a British-based identity to it. So we had to kind of create a brand, essentially, to go up and get these grants. But what it's meant is that we've been able to gather data, and we've been doing that for a couple of years now. So in the team that I'm a consultant to, this was a back in 2011, at the end of our first year of doing this, um, what we were finding is that um, we were much better at people being discharged, and I was operating in the team that we were working with, a non-diagnostic model, we were mon mon monitoring outcomes and working collaboratively with uh, families that we were seeing. So we compared to a, a similar team in our area. And as you can see from those figures, we were much better at discharging people and they were much less likely to end up uh, starting a career as an inpatient. A lot less likely. So actually, we were a lot more efficient. And the people who were discharging were discharging with effect sizes of change. In other words, amount of improvements very similar to that that you would find in research and not similar to what you find in the research on real life services. Now the interesting thing is, two years ago I became the consultant to that team. So I've been able to look at those um, figures two years later and something similar is happening. So compared to three years ago, and interestingly when I, when I um, became came the consultant to that team, uh, the way we work in the UK is we have catchment areas. So I'm a consultant uh, to a, a certain geographical area. When I left the catchment area that I was working with, I passed on seven patients. When I came to this catchment area, I inherited a hundred patients. And they were all on medication. And they were all uh, down in various diagnoses. And so most of the last two years, I've been involved uh, with doing a lot of medication work. And nearly all of it has been weaning people off successfully off various medications. It's not that difficult to do, but, you know, um, it does take a bit longer with people who've been cultured into a particular way of thinking about what, what's going on in their life. And already, after two years, we, we, we seem to be finding a similar pattern. So I, I think I can reasonably say those figures there was not because the team we were comparing with originally 
was uh, in, a, in an area with challenges that were different to the team that I was. So we've got this nice bit of triangulated data. And before um, Billy comes and drags me off, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs>